PHP now the key health concern for Asian shrimp producers. So let us all welcome our Dr. Andy Shin. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. We, we, we have a bit of a, a low bandwidth here today, but I'm hoping that uh, the presentation will come through smoothly. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, clear. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, before I begin, I would just like to, to say um, a big thank you to you, Ed, and to Xi, and to, uh, to Naka for the, uh, the very kind invitation to speak here today. Um, I'm speaking after eight fantastic presentations, um, and so um, my apologies in advance if I do repeat some of the information, but um, my talk is actually um, quite simple. And the reason for this is um, I do appreciate that there are lots of EHP um, experts listening in, but I also there are lots of other people, if I understand correctly from Ed, who have also a passion to learn a little bit more about uh, microspridians and um, EHP. I have, a, I have a bar that keeps uh, in the way. Let's see if we can slide it out of the way. Can I, is there, okay, let's, let's, can every, is everyone seeing my screen okay or are they seeing lots of other uh, commands as well or is it okay? No, we're, we're seeing your, only your screen. Your, the, the, those bars are only on your screen. <laughs> Fantastic, I'll try, I'll, try and, I'll try and work around a little bit. So I really just wanted to start giving you a quick introduction to microspridians and yesterday Tim gave a very nice introduction in as much as these are obligate intracellular parasites. They're a bit unusual because even though they're parasites, they actually belong to the fungi. All of these are spore forming. There are about 1500 species that we know of, but one of the most interesting things is they lack mitochondria. And as we've heard from nearly all the presentations, um, they do produce these very resistant infectious stages. Now I'm just showing you a picture of a stickleback. This is a, this is a species of fish I used to work on in Scotland. And what you can see here, if I can, uh, let's try that. No. For some reason, it's, um, it's just showing me your commands, Ed. It's not, oh, there we go. So um, one of the interesting things about um, these microspridians is they can actually cause castration, giantism, but also a change in their host sex. Fortunately, most of the, 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 the changes in sex that we see with microspridians occurs in insects. Now, what you can see on the screen there, you can see three very large cysts over five millimeters in diameter. Now, this is a single cell that has been infected by a microspridian. It's called a zoonoma. And then what happens is it undergoes this huge hypertrophied response and then inside, if I was to take a needle and puncture one of those zoonomas and draw out the fluid from inside, you can see at the top of my screen there, it's packed full with hundreds and millions and millions and millions of spores. Now, as um, both Tim and as Diva has, have, have just said, microspridians actually use an array of different strategies to complete their life cycles. So for example, we have a type one here at the top where we have a very direct um, infection cycle. We have a type two where it actually, we have the microspridium being transferred from the mother into the eggs and the eggs or the young then become infected that way. We have um, uh, type three at the bottom here. This is what we see in agmasoma. This is what we see in white cotton disease. And in this particular situation, we're dependent on the host to die as part of its transmission. So what happens is the muscle is infected, it dies, that then gets eaten by a fish, it goes through a new host, and then uh, it completes its life cycle that way. Type four is a bit more complicated. This, what, is, this is one we see in mosquitoes, we have, where we have quite complicated interactions in the life cycle, moving through different hosts to complete its life cycle. But for today, and I'm, I'm hoping you can, you can see the star appear, Entrocytozoan hepatopenae is a species that um, uses a very direct form of um, transmission. So 
Just to give you a little bit more background about other important um, microsporidians, they are uh, perhaps underappreciated in some way, but we also see microsporidian infections um, in fish. So for example, you can see this is Bico disease, again, where muscle cells become infected and you can see large packets of spores which appear as white pseudocysts um, in the muscle here. We can also see it in Pangasius. And for those of you that uh, enjoy eating fish, this is a, this is a popular fish um, that we like to eat um, in Scotland. Uh, this is monkfish. And when we take a look inside the brain, what we're looking at here, if I can just circle up all of these, are white uh, xenomas packed full of microsporidians. Just to take one last detour, because obviously today we, the focus needs to be on shrimp, but there is also another species of Entrocytozoan uh, which infects humans, which is um, Entrocytozoan bonosi. And again, as um, Diva just uh, highlighted in her talk, um, again, I want you to think about this life cycle because while it's possible that we are possibly seeing um, um, auto transmission, direct transmission, it's really important that we also consider um, other potential hosts that may play a role in the life cycle of enter, um, Entrocytozoa and Hepatopenae that we don't know about yet. So just bear this in mind that we do have infections in humans. Just to be uh, very, very clear, this particular species tends to infect people with a, um, a suppressed immune system. So it's seen, for example, in things like people with AIDS. It's also, we see commonly um, infections in pigs. And again, another thing I want to make very, very clear is even though we're talking about EHP today, it doesn't infect humans, or we don't knowingly know it infects humans. So please continue to enjoy eating your shrimp and enjoying um, um, all the tasty dishes that come, come with making shrimp. So uh, as I said today, we must focus on shrimp. So just to quickly mention another important species, which is Agmasoma. This is a species which infects the muscle and the connective tissue not the hepatopancreas. These produce quite large spores. And when I say large, um, we're talking about two to three microns in size. And when I say large, that's because when we talk about EHP, we're talking about a spore that's only about a micron by about 0.7 of a micron in size, so much, much smaller. The other thing about agmosoma is that it's dependent on the shrimp dying. The, the tissue then breaks down. This then gets eaten by a fish. The fish gets infected and it completes its life cycle that way. Whereas EHP is a direct life cycle. Again, you saw this sort of image uh, yesterday. This is why this is so important. This is why we're, we're talking about EHP today because when we see infections in, in shrimp ponds, we actually have a situation where the growth of the shrimp arrests or at least it slows down depending at what point it gets infected. And as Diva showed in her last presentation, we can have very patchy um, infections in our culture ponds. So even though we tend to think of one pond as a very homogeneous environment, that's not actually the case. As Diva showed, we can actually have hot spots of infection within our ponds, which means that we can have spots of our ponds perhaps where shrimp are either not infected or low, have low levels of infection, as opposed to shrimp which may acquire infection much earlier on in the production cycle, and then their production or their, their growth um, arrests, and then we start seeing smaller shrimp. So what you're looking at the screen now is you can actually see this is, this is a, a preparation that we've made um, from an hepatopancreas, and hopefully you'll, you'll get used to seeing the spores from the last presentations, but this slide has thousands and thousands of spores that we can see there. Um, this is just a, um, a, a little higher power, and hopefully you're beginning to see a little bit more of the structure. I've, I've made a drawing here, and I, I, I appreciate that it's probably not completely correct, but I just wanted to show you the main features of a microsporidian spore. So again, um, Diva discussed this um, uh, in, her, in her last talk, talking about um, the, polar, the polar filament. And this you can see, this is the polar filament coiled up inside here. We then have a, a, a sporoplasm inside, which is a, which is a parasite. And when, then we have a large vacuole, we have a nucleus um, and a couple of other, other structures inside. So 
Um, again, as we've heard from the last presentations from, from yesterday, we started to learn about um, EHP's impacts on shrimp production as, in as early as 2004. EHP formally described in 2009, and then as we went into 2015 through to 2018, we began to see a number of ponds be becoming infected um, with EHP. Um, the last uh, figures that we had was around 20 to 30% um, in 2018. But what I want to do today is I, I want to just give you a, a small update from some of the sampling that we've been doing here in, here in Thailand. So I'm just gonna go back to, to, to the spore and uh, here's our shrimp. And as Diva said, what happens is that once that spore gets inside, uh, inside the shrimp, that polar filament fires out. And as this polar filament fires, it turns inside out and it's fired out at great speed. And as it fires out, as Diva said, it punctures one of the cells. And then um, the change in pressure, you can see the vacuole at the bottom, but also with a change in pressure in puncturing that cell, that causes the sporoplasm to pass down that tube and directly into the cell. So it's a hypodermic insertion of the parasitic stage. And you can see in this SEM here, this is not EHP, but this is another microspridian just, just to show. And here you can see that polar filament that's been extruded. Um, you can just see the sequence of events here. This is just to show you um, graphically what's typically happening. That polar, polar filament is firing, it's turning inside out. That sporoplasm is traveling down the tube directly into the cell. And then when we look actually at the, the cells inside the shrimp, this is what you can see. And again, you've seen a couple of these images being presented over the last two days, where you can see lots of spores inside the cells. Um, Diva, I have to say we've loved, we've loved your work and your research, and we've also followed it very, very closely. We also um, had a go at um, um, isolating some spores and it worked very nicely. Um, and this was a good way for us to then use some of these spores to, to explore um, other chemicals as well, just to see how they were performing. So again, Diva, Diva's pictures are much nicer than, than my pictures here, but again, you can see this polar film, very, very, very long when you compare it to the size of the spore. Just another one on the top here. So again, this is work by Diva. And I do encourage you to read her paper on this because it's a, it's, it's a very interesting work. Um, just a couple of other images, just to show you to the side here. So you can also see that some of these spores, they have fired, but they're perhaps less impressive. You can see that they've just popped out just a little bit. And as Diva said in her last presentation, we really have to understand a little bit more about um, how some of these chemical, how the spores are responding to the chemicals. It's really important that we understand the maturity stage of, of the spores as well, because um, that may also have an impact on how we interpret some of the spores when we purify them, we expose them to chemicals and then we score them. So if we use spores that are too young, we may have an effective comp compound, but if we don't score it properly, we may miss a true response. So this is really important. So Diva's point about looking at the maturity of spores is, a, is an important consideration. Okay, so just looking at uh, infections inside the shrimp. Again, we've got a nice uh, slide with lots of spores in the background again here. Um, again, as, um, sorry, Diva, I'm going to refer a lot to your presentation. It was very nice. Um, Auto-infection is probably, is probably probably very likely. We, we see it in many other microspridians. We see it in other parasite systems, for example, in coccidia, as we see in chickens and pigs and lambs, uh, where, for example, you have an infection in the cell that uh, you then get proliferation of the spores inside the cell. And then two things happen. Either the, the cell bursts and those spores are released. Or alternatively, that spore, as it matures inside the cell, it migrates to the cell membrane, it then pinches off and is then released into the lumen. So you can have um, cells which are producing spores and releasing spores, but, but the cell is not always bursting. So once you have those spores being released, it's then possible um, that it then infects the next cell along the tubule. So I think this auto-infection is, is, is very likely. Um, again, from Celia's talk yesterday, um, 
she, she, she was talking about um, some of the struggles about dealing with treatments. And she's absolutely right, because when we start thinking about treatments of EHP, really we have to think about a double-pronged attack. Because once those spores are inside the hepatopancreas, they are in somewhat protected by the, by the, by the shrimp. So if we're going to find uh, an effective treatment, we have to find something that works um, in vivo, okay? something, something that can get into the hepatopancreas, can um, kill those spores, kill those plasmodia, but not cause damage to the shrimp. At the same time, again, you've heard from all the presentations that we're seeing huge numbers of spores being released into the environment. Um, they're in the water column, they're in the sediments, again, as you heard from Diva. So again, we may have to think about as part of our treatment, we may then have to have a second uh, treatment regime that is specific for just targeting those spores in the water column and in the sediments. Um, perhaps my main point I would really like to make on this slide is that really when we have infection, um, unless we have some really amazing um, treatments, I think just given the number of spores that are released from shrimp into the ponds and the size of the pond systems that we currently work with. Sometimes they're up to 10 hectares and more in size. I think if we have an infection in a pond, then it really has to be continuous. So once we detect EHP in our stock, I'm afraid that the management of that EHP is gonna be have something that we're just gonna to have to keep on top of until that particular crop is harvested out. Um, again, just to um, answer one of the questions uh, that was posed from the last talk, um, somebody was asking about the life cycle of, um, um, of EHP. And from our own experience, um, we set up lab infections very, very easy in, in our lab. And what we do is we take the hepatopancreas, we first of all check the hepatopancreas of some shrimp to make sure that they have spores. We then, um, they're fresh, of course, we then mince those spores up. We then mince, uh, mix it with a little uh, shrimp feed, maybe top dress it with some squid oil, and then we feed it just directly to the shrimp. And you can see here, this was just one last experiment where we did, where we had a very heavy infection. We had um, uh, about uh, two times 10 to the seven spores in the samples that we analyzed. We gave 30 shrimp about two, two and a half grams of, of, of minced tissue and uh, shrimp feed. And then seven days later, we actually got a nice infection with around one times 10 to the four spores. And just to confirm, just in case anybody is um, questioning that, we were actually seeing um, the spores inside the cells of those new, new shrimp, okay? So this is not just about molecular determination. What we do is we, we use the phylloxin B um, method that's come out of um, the, the lab in Mahadon. So we, we check on the microscope, and also we do a qPCR check as well. So we've, we're, we're, we're checking our shrimp by both ways. Um, for those of you that are perhaps um, new to EHP and you're perhaps wondering uh, some of the things that we're doing, I'm hoping you can see the video playing on screen, but this is just one video where we do um, a quick check of the health of the shrimp. So here we're just doing a quick external shrimp. We're looking for any abnormalities, any black spots, um, you saw uh, just a few seconds ago looking at the tail. Um, sometimes the shape of the tail can tell us if there's a systemic infection. So for example, you can see in the image here, we have some swollen tips. This might suggest a bacterial infection. I just throw it in there for interest. And then as the video continues to play, what we're doing is we're just removing um, a carapace and you can see we're just uh, snipping that away. Um, obviously, this would take a, a little too long if I was to play it um, continuously, but you can see we're just going to um, remove um, the carapace covering the gills. If we were interested in the gills, we would take a sample at this particular point, but for today, we're more interested about getting the, the gut out and looking at the hepatopancreas. So let's um, perhaps speed this video up a little bit if we can move it on. There we go. We're speeding along. So just removing both sides. I realize that there are lots of experts watching this video. So I, I hope our technique is consistent with their own, but this is, 
this is this is one that we use to um, to get out the gut. So you just saw a snip off uh, the gut at the posterior. You can just see we're just grabbing the gut by the esophagus, gently, very gently. You just pull the gut forward. Everything should come out, and you've got the esophagus, the stomach, the hepatopancreas, and the gut. And you can now process this in a number of different ways, looking for um, EHP spores. So. Um, one thing we have tend to find is, is sometimes that uh, it's also important to check the body condition of the shrimp. Sometimes a, a soft shell may allude to other infections as well. So here we have our, our, our hepatopancreas and gut that we've taken out. Please note this yellow circle, okay, because this is basically the top of the gut. This is an important site. This is where we like to look for the spores. And if you just gently pull this gut, it will actually detach from this point in the hepatopancreas. You can then lay that onto a slide and then using um, a microscope slide, this is this blue line here is supposed to be a microscope slide. You can gently just move it along the gut and you can remove all the feces from inside the gut. What you can do now is you can now put um, a drop of sodium chloride on there You can put a drop of phylloxin B or you can just cover it and make a preparation. And you can then examine this under the microscope. So we typically would look at this area here, as I said, this ring circle here, this is the yellow region here. We tend to find that this is, this is a good place for where spores are collecting. It's, a, it's an easy site to target if you're going to use the microscope to look for those spores. Of course, the condition of the gut, lots of black, black, lots of black spots, lots of black chromatophores, in this particular case is perhaps indicating that this is a shrimp under some degree of stress. So this might allude to either an EHP infection or some other infection that we need to, to cross check for. Of course, we're also checking the hepatopancreas as well. So you can see in this image just to the left here, what we do is we slice the hepatopancreas longitudinally, and then we take a small piece from the anterior, the median and the posterior, pop, pop it onto a slide, and we check the condition of the tubules in each of those three regions. And again, yesterday, uh, Tim Flagel um, mentioned that um, if you just target one particular point, you may actually miss some of the infection or, or perhaps um, as he was saying is, you may get a false picture that you may think perhaps the infection is higher or lower than it really is. So we use the whole of that hepatopancreas when we do our next molecular check. So again, here we've got our preparation, we've got our spores. We focused on that particular point at the front of the gut for looking at spores. And um, if you don't stain your slide, and I'm hoping you can see um, my, 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 my slide just to the left here, um, hopefully you can see all the collections of spores inside those cells there. Now, I'm completely colorblind, but I'm, I'm told um, that these spores might actually have a faint, a faint blue or green color. So I must admit that when I'm searching, I, I'm actually looking for shape, which is not always the best way to go forward, really. If you can use another way of helping you identify the spores, that's always very helpful. Of course, we're going to te test, um, check the hepatopancreas as Celia was talking about yesterday. So in this particular case, we can see lots of dark, uh, transform tubules. Again, this might allude to um, a bacterial infection. Of course, we have other work to do here in our diagnostics and checking the health of this particular shrimp. So here are some of the slides that we've prepared for EHP. And um, it seems quite simple, doesn't it? So if you look at this slide here, you can probably see those spores there, nice and clear. If you've got good eyes, you can probably spot uh, a few spores there. Um, there are some spores there, but they're getting a little, a little more difficult to spot. And are these spores? I don't know. Well, maybe, maybe they are, maybe they're not. So sometimes it's not always easy to, to spot these um, EHP spores, especially when they're at low concentrations and you're using the microscope only. Now, this is where the phylloxin B method um, is really very, very nice. And, it's, 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 and it can help farmers immensely do their own checks on their farm. Because as you saw, you just take the gut out, as, I, as, as, you, uh, as I've shown you just in the last few slides, 
put a drop on, cover it with a cover slip, and as Dr. Galliar said, you only need to wait uh, a few minutes. Five or 10 minutes will really give you a really nice level of staining, but, but literally you can start examining slides after one or two minutes. And this is the kind of level of staining that you can see. Now, for me, who's completely colorblind, if I can spot spores like this, this really helps speed up my, my screening um, of slides. So as you can see here in the slides, just to the, to the right of the, of the screen, you can see I've got lots and lots of slides to go through. If I can stain them and spot them um, using the Philoxin B, it really does make my life much, much easier. It's a really friendly way. It's nothing complicated. Microscopes don't need to be expensive. I think there was a great question yesterday about saying, um, do we need a fancy microscope? No, but you do need a times 100 objective. Um, so you're going to use a little bit of oil to look um, for the spores in that particular region where I showed you. Um, a couple of an other important points to note about. Um, some of the shrimp um, ponds that we work in, as, you, as you've heard, are enormous. Sometimes they're up to 10 hectares in size. And so there is an importance about how you actually sample your shrimp. So if you're happy, then just go in with a random sample. And we recommend that you take, um, if you're actually culturing in the pond already, that you take 30 shrimp and you divide these into three samples of 10. As Diva said, it's really important that if the shrimp are any larger than PL15, that you chop off the eye stalks because there's, there's something in the eye stalks that can inhibit some of the PCR reaction. So we just really wanna target some of that hepatopancreas. If, however, we start to see small shrimp, perhaps shrimp that are not growing so well, then this time we want to take a targeted approach. In this case, we're saying, I'm not happy with how my shrimp look. I really want to check those particular shrimp. So in that case, you would take a targeted um, approach. Just a couple of other things to, to, to mention about what sampling regime we're doing. So we strongly recommend to farmers that they check their PL before they stock. And we recommend that we take three um, replicates of 100 PL. So we're processing that as a typical sample um, before we stock into a pond. Then we encourage farmers to take a sample, uh, take a sample of shrimp within the first 30 days, and then another sample within the first 60 days. And hopefully after the shrimp are about 60 days old, hopefully they're getting into a size range where they've crossed that um, critical point where the farmer is then beginning to make money. So these are the typical sorts of numbers that we're, we're using. So what about um, our sampling program? So for the last two years, we've been offering um, free diagnostic testing to um, shrimp farmers in three provinces in Thailand in Surakhtani, in Champagne, in, and in Rayon. And this is a project that's been supported by Walmart and the ID, uh, IDH. And we've been testing um, for three key diseases, AHP and D, EHP, and white spot. And I've just put up the figures of all three diseases, just in case you're, you're interested, but, but really it's just the summary that I really want to highlight here. So. Over the last 18 months, I've chopped some of the data out because um, we were developing some of the protocols right at the beginning and we were just perfecting our diagnostic methods. So I'm just gonna focus on 96 farms that we sampled, 550 ponds. And you can see from the 550 50 ponds, we tested EHP in 509 of those ponds. And we found that 429 of those were, were positive for EHP. And when I say positive, we're testing both by the microscope for LOX and B method and also by um, a CPCR, QPCR method as well. Um, yesterday, there was another great question about um, combined infections. And Tim was talking about um, white feces and how bacterial infections are commonly seen um, alongside EHP infections. Um, so I've just listed um, AHP and D here, EHP and white spot. We don't really see um, all three infections, um, nor do we see AHP and white spot together from what we've done from our testing. We just had two positive samples of EHP and white spot together, 
but we had quite a lot. We had 14% of um, our samples came back positive for AHP and D, or AHP and D, the peer toxin, and, and, and EHP as well. So we've got a little bit more investigation uh, to do there, but I thought you might be interested just to see that result. Um, just to talk a little bit further about some of the things that we've been doing when we've been exploring um, those particular ponds. Um, first of all, we, we looked at whether, we wanted to understand whether there were just any common factors. So we looked at whether ponds had a, had a toilet, a shrimp toilet, where waste was being removed or not. And here, I just really want you to focus on the figures in blue. So you can see that ponds with a shrimp toilet had a lower infection than those which were not uh, removing um, feces and uneaten food and waste on a, on a daily basis. We then looked at ponds, whether they were just earth ponds, whether they were slope lined, or whether they were fully lined ponds. And again, I've grouped the earth and the slope ponds together because they both have earth bottoms. And again, you can see that the fully lined ponds had much lower infections than those with the earth bottom. And again, when you do the combination of these, where you have earth and toilet and slope and toilet or, or fully lined and toilet or not, then these are the sorts of figures that you get. So um, typically earth ponds, whether they have um, a toilet or not, are somewhere in the region of around 75 to 81% of the ponds are infected. But those which were fully lined were, were lower. They were around 61 to 75. Now, this 75 figure perhaps indicates really that once you get an infection in the ponds, it's, it's, it's probably suggesting that uh, it's a, a factor of PL going in or it's, or it's water or it's a lack of disinfection between crop cycles. So even though we would like to say fully lined ponds is going to give you some form of protection, you can still see we're seeing very high rates of infection. So I think we have to interpret this uh, very, very carefully. So infection over the last six to 12 months, we're looking at around 84.0% of um, the ponds that we looked at in Thailand were infected with EHP. Now, again, I would just like to raise a note of caution because we looked at um, 135 farms, 135 farms, but there are 21 and a half thousand farms in Thailand. Um, so we've only looked at around 0.6%. And in a number of um, um, areas where farmers wanted to engage with the project. So I think we have to be very careful about overgeneralizing. So while this 84.8% is very, very interesting, I do think that it's important that we bear in mind um, that it's only a small percentage of those farms in Thailand that we're actually sampling. So I just want to be um, not too sensationalist. I just want to ground it in common sense and say that we need to think you know, quite realistically about what we've sampled. So what, what does this all mean in terms of the economic losses? Now, yesterday, I was really interested because Dr. Sood from India gave a very nice um, presentation. And in his presentation, he started to talk about some of the losses that they've been seeing in, in India. So if I can not talk about 2020, where we've had COVID to deal with, so I'm going to look at the year before, but we had about 300,000 tonnes of white leg shrimp produced in Thailand. The, the average price per ton was pretty close to $5,000 per ton. Um, if we have that 84.8% infection, but if we consider that the lowest province where we found infection was Rayong, and we only found 58% of farms there had an infection. Um, I have a colleague who's done some fantastic work and he's, he's currently writing up his study at the moment, but he's looked at 106 ponds over 11 consecutive crops. And the beauty of this particular data is um, they have not um, altered on the factor. So it's just been consistent farming for 11 crops, 106 ponds. He's generated half a million uh, bits of data. He's got some amazing data, but what he's found is, is that in the ponds um, which are uninfected, he's getting about, um, an average weight of his shrimp at around 18.7 grams at the point at which they decide to harvest. But in the ponds where they have EHP, he's only seeing an average of about 13 grams. So he's losing about 30% of his, of his weight of his shrimp. When you look at the FCRs, 
he was seeing very small differences in his FCRs. Um, interestingly, again, as Diva and many others said yesterday, there was no difference in the survival. We saw 83% survival in, um, in both sets of ponds. Um, however, when you start looking at the production costs, then e, uh, EHP is costing a loss of around 23%. So if we use all these different pieces of information in a very crude kind of way, then we're looking at possibly losses in Thailand for 2019 of somewhere in the region of around 78,000 tons to 112,000 tons, somewhere in the region of around 388 to $555 million lost. And the reason I was really interested by uh, Dr. Sood's uh, talk, because he gave a very similar figure of around this sort of half a billion, you know, half a billion dollars potential loss due to, due to EHP. So this, this makes me feel a little happier about these figures. But again, very, very complicated to, to try and calculate. And again, we have to think very carefully about how we, how we interpret the data. Of course, we couldn't go a talk without mentioning COVID. And just to say that it really is not possible to look over this last year about um, how COVID has had an impact on shrimp prices, because we can see that um, um, with the start of the year, many countries experienced um, um, the advent of COVID. Uh, we then started seeing countries with mortality, sadly. Many countries, um, stopped exports and imports. And you can see this had dramatic effects, for example, on the shrimp prices here in Thailand. But you can see that as we go through the year, um, the larger shrimp seem to do quite well. They, their prices seem to maintain quite nicely. But you can see here that the size of the small shrimp really goes through quite a, quite a change. When we look at the number of tons um, passing through Thailand's main market, it seems to suggest there's an increase in production. There's more tonnage coming through, but the data seems to suggest that it's smaller size shrimp. And the question is, is this um, a response to EHP causing impacts to shrimp? Or is it a response by farmers who are trying to perhaps reduce the risks of keeping the shrimp in their ponds for shorter periods of time, reducing the potential risks of loss? They know that they can sell shrimp in Thailand because Thais love love to eat shrimp. So is this really a response to the sorts of situations um, of what's happening uh, with COVID? It's very difficult to unpick the two. Um, again, as um, Celia said yesterday, this is, this, is, this is perhaps the first thing that um, indicates when there's a problem. The, the, the farmers are going in every day, they're looking at their, the, the, sh the shrimp who are eating, um, uh, eating and growing. And when they start to see growth arresting, this is when they perhaps have a, a very early indication that, so, that there's a problem with EHP. So that you can see that their growth figure begins to, to flatten off a little, a little, a little bit. We might see a change in FCR as opposed to those with EHP and, um, and white feces. So as part of the project that we've been working on, we've developed a shrimp tool for farmers, which allows them, I'm just gonna run through these very, very quickly. But it does allow farmers to map the production data in each of their ponds. It allows them to share their disease data if they, if they wish with their neighbors. Um, and this basically is trying to create, um, if you like, uh, notifications of when there are disease alerts. So for example, if one farm is experiencing a problem with either AHP and EHP or white spot, he can, he can put an alert out on the system and this tells other farmers not to perhaps um, withdraw water from the river system if he's discharged perhaps in recent days. So it's, it's trying to share information for the benefits of production in a particular area. If you'd like to know more about the shrimp app, please drop me a line at the end and we'll tell you a little bit more about it and how you can get involved. Um, I'm just going to move towards um, the last couple of slides now. Um, we've heard many slides, talk, uh, many presentations talking about, um, about the control uh, of EHP in, in different systems. So if you're in a hatchery, it's really important that between your crop cycles that you do a proper disinfection, not only of the tanks, but also of the, of the pipework. We've, talk, we've, we've heard um, talks from um, D. 
Diva and Celia and many others about how it's really important to maintain tight biosecurity, use high pH to try and uh, cause those, spot, those uh, spores to fire so they become inactive. It's really important that you continuously check your stock and only stock EHP free animals into your system. If you do find that your animals begin to start um, stop feeding in the way that you would expect them to, or as you're doing your routine health checks, that you start to see some of those tubules uh, changing in their, in, their, in their presentation, start to swell, um, then really get an EHP check done on those as well. We've already talked about that. And of course, we've also heard, uh, from, again, I think it was Dr. Sue yesterday talking about how one of the mitigation strategies is to try and use high quality uh, shrimp diets to ensure uh, good growth. Um, when you're actually stocking into your pond, again, it's really important that we, you make sure that you're only stocking disease-free animals. It's much better to control animals before you put them into the system rather than to put disease animals into a pond and then try and deal uh, with the infection. Of course, it's really important that you only buy your PL from uh, registered hatcheries. Some of them will actually issue a health certificate. This is great if they will do the checks for you, which means that you can have some confidence. Be suspicious yourself, conduct your own health checks. You can see that the microscope check is actually quite easy. It's really nice and you can do it yourself at the farm level. Um, we've heard about um, the importance of trying to make sure you disinfect properly between crop cycles. Um, and you heard again from Diva how they're looking currently at uh, um, water quality and how um, proper um, uh, uh, treatment of the water before it's used in ponds is also another critical consideration. We've also heard elsewhere that some people who have earth ponds, um, not only are they using lime, but they're sometimes also using propane uh, burners to actually scorch the sediment to try and uh, deactivate the spores that way. Um, we also heard from Diva as well. Um, I just wanted to pop up this slide, but it's also important to be very, be very aware of potential reservoirs of infections because you can actually have infections inside muscles, as uh, Diva said. Um, these can be on the bottom of floats, boats, poles, um, we went to one farm and you can see a huge mass of mussels along the side of the pond here. Uh, this was actually a new species of, of mussel, which again is also quite worrying because this is a new invasive species. So we, we have problems not only with EHP proliferation, but also other invaders coming in. Again, I've taken this slide uh, from Diva's work. Again, Diva, we liked this study very much. This shows... Um, how she was looking at some of the, the treatment regimes. And she's already discussed this in her last presentation, but I just want to focus on the potassium permanganate. So you can see here from her work, um, suggesting that um, uh, potassium permanganate uh, for 15 minutes was quite uh, effective at uh, deactivating those spores um, in lab trials. Again, when you're doing your trials, again, I just want to be really um, point out that um, as you score your spores, sometimes you'll see this beautiful firing, sometimes you'll only just see a little little firing. So we have to be very mindful of the maturity of the spores that we're looking at. So many farmers are using potassium permanganate to treat their settlement ponds. So you can see potassium permanganate here pouring into the water at the top here. I think it's really important to raise the importance of organic loading because if you don't check the organic load of your water and you treat um, at the recommended dose without making the compensation, then you could actually have an ineffective treatment. And I can explain this a little clearer in the next slide. So here we have a farm site. This is the culture pond over the back here. This over here to the left is a settlement pond. Over to the right, we have a treatment pond. And then in the middle here, you can see we've got a big drum full of potassium permanganate. The farmer's got a very nice system. He's dribbling potassium permanganate into the intake pipe. It then passes underneath the soil here, across here, into the treatment pond. Now, it's a nice setup, but however, there are a couple of things that, that basically um, made his treatment inactive. First of all, 
the flow rate here was so short that he wasn't getting the contact time, which, which basically meant he wasn't having the full 15 minutes with the right dose of potassium permanganate to deactivate those spores. The next thing was when he uh, finished the harvest of his pond here, he emptied this pond directly into the settlement pond. And you can see here that all the organic rich water was dumping, dumping straight into this pond here. It was then being sucked straight in and straight across. Now, this high organic load was basically inactivating the potassium permanganate. It was rendering it um, useless, essentially. Another thing on this particular site, he also had a fish pond just very close, just out of shot here. And again, all these fish swimming around was also stirring up the water, creating very organic, rich, turbid water. Again, another factor which was basically making his uh, treatment uh, less effective. So we can see um, potassium permanganate is commonly used on farms. It's very important. But what I'm going to just show you here um, in the screen here, I've got some blue lines that appeared on my screen here. I don't know if you're seeing them, but uh, I'm not sure where they've appeared from. But this is my colleague. And what he's doing here, he's just taking some, some pond water. We're just outside uh, one of the labs here. He's just measuring out um, a litre or eight, 800 ml like this. And basically what he's doing, he's setting up a titration series with potassium permanganate. So this is water straight out of the settlement pond. He's then, um, then going to add potassium permanganate at a range from uh, 1 ppm through to 10 ppm. So hopefully the next uh, video is just about to start as he pours that last little bit in there. And you should start seeing him add the potassium permanganate. The good news is, is that potassium permanganate is very easy to get hold of. You can buy it at 7-Elevens, many of the uh, high street shops. So it's a very easy way of setting up um, a titration of your water quality. And then what you're going to do is after you've, after you've added the potassium permanganate and mixed it, you're then going to wait 15 minutes and you're then going to look at the color of that water. So you can see, as we look along the line of those beakers there, you can see at this end, almost colorless, at the other end, dark pink. So you can, this is what you're seeing. This is 1 ppm, this is 10 ppm. Now for bacterial treatment, we typically use a two milligram dose. If we went in with a two milligram dose without any adjustment, you can see, this is two ppm here, we would still have bacteria growing on our plate. But of course, what we have to do is an adjustment. We have to times the last concentration where we still see a faint pink color by two and a half. So this tells us that we need to use five ppm potassium permanganate to get a proper disinfection. Now this is a Petri dish here with four ppm. I know we're talking about EHP, but it's much easier to show you this as a, as a bacterial demonstration. But you can see when we use this adjustment, we have no bacteria. Again, an important I want to make very, very clear. It's more important to try and reduce the organic loading rather than just increase the concentration of potassium permanganate or chemicals. We really want to move to a system where, we're, where we have green farming, whereby we help farmers deal with infections in a green way rather than telling them to use more and more chemicals. So this is why I really like non-chemical waste. And we were able to help the farmer just by telling him to move his fish pond, um, increase the length of the pipe so he got his full 15 minutes disinfection time, very simple, cheap things that he could do on his farm. Um, we've produced a, a couple of very simple um, fact sheets. Ed has very kindly put up the English version of this on the NACA website. We now have this in Bahasa, Vietnamese, Gujarati, Thai, and in English. If you would like these, I'll pass them to Ed, and, and hopefully Ed, Ed will um, pop them up on the website. Alternatively, please send me an email. I'll be delighted to send one to you. As I close, I just want to thank um, some of my colleagues who have been working on this, to Pin and Cleo and Tree, who work in the three um, mobile shrimp clinics at the three shrimp clubs. Bao, who's been working with farmers, trying to get them to use the app. And also Ralph, who's based in Norway, who's also been developing this production app to help farmers monitor their growth. And with that, Ed, again, I would just like to thank you again for the kind invitation and thank you everybody for 
for listening to me today. Thank you very much. Thank you.